All right, so you were talking about overwriting methods. If you remember our class hierarchy from last time, we've got our object class and we have our chain of inheritance going downward. As we progress through our different classes in our hierarchy, remember that every subclass here, high school student, student, person, each of those is going to inherit all of the public methods from their super class. And after we inherit these methods, they're going to stay public. They're not going to become private somehow. So we inherit public methods, they stay public. So for example, if my person class has a method called get name built in, both student and high school student would have that method as well. They would inherit that method from their parent or grandparent. Now, there are some scenarios where we want our subclass and superclass to have the same method, but to have that method do different things. And one of the best examples here is the two string method. Obviously, a student and a person are going to have slightly different representations in their string version. So my person class, I would build my two string saying return name was born on birthday, because that's pretty much all the information that we have. Where in my student class, my student to string might say the person's name is in grade, whatever grade level they have. And this uh, is a different representation across my two different classes. So this idea is called overriding methods. And method overrides allow our subclasses to redefine a method instead of inheriting it from their superclass. And this process happens when a public method in the subclass has the exact same method signature as a public method in the superclass. Remember that the signature for a method is its return type, its name, and its parameter list. If all three of those things are the same for a method in the subclass and in the superclass, the method will be overridden. When we perform a method overwrite, override, the appropriate method will be called for objects of the appropriate type. So if I make a person object and I print it, the person classes to string will be called. If I make a student object and I print it, my student classes to string will be called. So whatever the most appropriate method is for each type of object. And this is very similar to uh, scope. If we remember back to how scope works, um, we're going to find the most local version of a variable and utilize that variable. Same thing kind of applies here. If we have a more local definition for a method, we're going to use that method call rather than the superclasses method call. So that is what is happening when we are overwriting. Earlier in the year, we learned about a thing we can do with methods with a very similar name, overloading. The names are similar, but the implementation is very different. In a method override, which is what we're learning about today, methods are going to be defined within separate classes. We'll have methods defined in a superclass and subclass. And our method signatures are going to match exactly. They'll have the same return type, they'll have the same name, and they'll have the same parameters. With a method overload, this is what happens when we have multiple methods with the same name, but we have different parameters or different lists of parameters being uh, defined for our different methods. This lets us call our methods with different sets or different numbers of parameters. So with an overload, our methods are going to be defined within the same class. So override is when a subclass is replacing its superclasses methods. Overload is when we have multiple different Call, types of call to the exact same named method. Does that make sense? Is that a distinction? Cool. 
when we choose to overwrite a method, um, there's a special piece of Java notation that we can use to show that we're doing this. We can add an at override to the line before we perform that overwriting. So we'll just, it's something we can put on that line. It's kind of like a comment that both us and the computer are going to read. Uh, now, the inclusion of this notation isn't required, and overwriting is still going to happen if we don't include it. So we don't need to have it, but it is best practice to use the override notation for two reasons. Reason number one, it helps with debugging, which is a process we can use where we kind of go step by step through our code, seeing where an error is occurring. And when we use at override, our compiler is going to double check that we're actually correctly overriding the method from the superclass. If that the name matches, that our parameters match, that everything lines up correctly. Secondly, override the notation uh, increases the ability or the readability of our code because it's much more clear that a superclass method is being overridden. So that's why I said it's like a comment for both us and the computer. It helps the computer check that we're correctly overriding and it lets anyone reading our program see that the this method is in fact being overridden uh, we're, or rather we're overwriting one from a superclass. It just helps with clarity. So uh, when we consider the design for our class hierarchy, remember we're going to put our shared methods and variables into the superclass and then we build out our subclasses to add more specific methods and instance variables and when we call methods from an object java is first going to check whether that object's class has that method defined just like with scope if my current object does have that method defined we're going to use that one if not Job is going to check within the superclass and see if the superclass has it. If the superclass doesn't have it, it's going to check its superclass and move, move its way up the chain. If that method call isn't found anywhere in the chain, Java is going to throw an error saying, hey, you haven't defined that method. That doesn't exist. So we're going to look at an example of this with two classes, rectangle and square. So our rectangle class, this is similar to the one we've been working with. Or we worked with a lot last semester. We've got our width and height as instance variables. Our constructor fills those in. Our get area returns width times height. And our two string is going to say it's going to return a rectangle with width, width and height, height. Very simple uh, two string. Now, our square class is extending rectangle. All squares are rectangles. And our square constructor is going to take the length of a side. A square is a special type of rectangle where all four sides are the same length. So we only need one parameter here. Um, we also don't really need any instance variables within my square class because it's just a very much more specific type of rectangle. We don't have any special qualities of a square that a rectangle isn't also going to have. So we don't need any special instance variables. In my square constructor, we're going to call our superclasses constructor. We're going to call a rectangle with side length and side length. It's going to initialize width and height to be the same exact value. Our get side method, we're going to return our super classes get height. We're going to cover using the super uh, keyword more next class. And then we're going to override it with our two string. Uh, and we're going to say square with side lengths get side. And we're using our get side method here because we don't have a private instance variable to represent the length of one side uh, because all of the dimension data is held within our superclass rectangle. So we're going to call get side, which is going to get our parent object's parent height, which is going to get passed back down to our string. 
So we have our same implementation. We've got our rectangle and square boxes. And let's say we are running our code. Let's say we make a square object called box equals new square five. So when I run that, we're going to be running our square constructor. I realize the text is very, very small. It has to be small to, to fit on the slide. So um, we're calling our square constructor. We're passing five through to our side length. And the first thing we do in our square constructor is call our superclass constructor, where we pass side length and side length. So we pass five and five up through here. This dot width is W, this dot height is H. Those were both five. Width and height are now both initialized to the value five. Our rectangle constructor finishes. Our square constructor doesn't have any other things to do. So we jump back up and we go to our next line. Then we are going to print our box. So does box have a two string defined within it? Does square have a two string method? Yes, it does. If, if we remember back to our previous implementation, square absolutely does have a two string. So we're going to call the most local two string class, the one from or two string method from our square class. So this is going to return a square with side lengths, and we're going to call the get side method. So we jump back up into the get side. The thing we do inside of get side is we call super dot get height. We're going to call our super classes get height method. We jump up. I didn't show that we've implemented those, but we can just assume that we have getter and setter methods implemented. So we're going to pass that height down. It's going to get returned. We're going to return that value. We're going to return five down to our uh, two string. We have square root side lengths five. That jumps back out. And we say system dot out dot print line square with side lengths five. So we're jumping up and down through our classes to actually have this print value come out. And our last thing that we do, we system dot dot print line area plus box dot get area. So remember back to square. Did square have a get area method defined? It did not. So since square doesn't have a, a get area, we're going to look within rectangle. Rectangle does have a get area. So we're going to call our rectangle get area because it is public. It is inherited by square. So our box is totally able to use it. In my get area, what we do is we are going to return width times height. Width is 5, height is 5. 5 times 5 is 25. We return that value. And then we print area 25. That makes sense how we're accessing from within the different classes. Cool. So recap, any method that we call from an object needs to be defined somewhere in the class hierarchy, whether it's defined within the subclass or within one of its superclasses. All subclasses are going to inherit every public method from their superclass. And after we do this inheritance, our subclasses can then implement more specific methods if they want, or they can override the methods that they've inherited. And we override when we uh, name, or when we make a public method in a subclass with the exact same signature as a public method in the superclass. Remember, it's very similar to how scope works. We can make a more local variable within a method or within a constructor or something. That's the variable that we're going to use rather than the, uh, the more broad one. So we're going to use the overridden method in the subclass rather than the one from the superclass. All right. And there we go.